There's a well-known story about how the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, was written. Its writer, Horatio Spafford, was a successful Christian businessman in the 19th century who tragically lost four of his daughters in a maritime disaster on the Atlantic Ocean. And after his tremendous loss, he sailed to England to comfort his grieving wife. And as his boat passed over the spot where his children died, he penned these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. The reason that Spafford was able to write this hymn was because he had confidence before God that God was a good God, that he's a sovereign God, that he looked forward, this man who lost his family, looked forward to the time when Christ would return and set all things right, even though at the moment everything seemed wrong. He had confidence that God, who is the epitome of goodness and righteousness and holiness, may allow evil for his divine purpose and his ultimate glory and even for our ultimate good. And what a comfort it is to know that God not only loves and cares for us, but that he works all things for the good of those who love him as well. What a comfort that Jesus can sympathize with our sadnesses. And he can sympathize with our suffering, and he can sympathize with our loss, because he also suffered, and he also lost. He even lost his life for us. And far from being a detractor to the Christian faith, the doctrine of God's sovereignty over everything is a most soothing and wonderful doctrine. The forces of evil, the forces of evil shall not win in the end. Christ is the victor, and therefore not even death is able to thwart his purposes. And the God who controls all is also the God who hears our prayers. And friends, the only way, the only way that a man could write the words, it is well with my soul, as he is in a boat floating over the watery graves of his four daughters, is if he has confidence in and before God. That's the only way. My prayer is that God would give us that same confidence today. Let's pray. Oh Lord, sometimes we don't understand why horrible things happen in the world. Even all we have to do is just turn on the news and see all these terrible things. Even just this week, Lord, we pray for the people of London who have been under siege with terrorist attacks for months now and even yesterday. And we see tragedies happen all around us. We don't understand why, and Lord, sometimes when we even pray, it seems like the answer to our prayer is no. Sometimes it seems like it's no. Sometimes it's no even well, way more than we want. Lord, we don't necessarily understand why that is, but we do believe that your no to our prayer is is even better for us than if you said yes to our prayers in some cases. And if our will conforms to your will, then amen, Lord. Give us what we desire because it's what's best. And if our will does not conform to your will, Lord, then you can say no and we trust your no because your way for us is better than our way for us. Lord, Please be with this church now. Give us the Holy Spirit. Help us to follow and obey and believe your words. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in 1 John chapter 3. We're looking at uh, verses 21 to 24. If you'd open your Bibles there. 
Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God, and God in Him, and by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given to us. Think about what an amazing thing that is that John has just said. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And it's not arrogant for John to say that. To say that we can actually have confidence. The Greek word for confidence here means boldness. Or even in another place, freedom of speech. Think about that for a second. We can have freedom of speech before God. How is that even possible? How is it possible to have freedom of speech before God? What does this mean? What is he talking about here? What John is saying is that. If our hearts don't condemn us because we have a relationship with God and God is our Father, we can actually go before the Almighty God, the one who at Mount Sinai was like a cloud of darkness and lightning and rumbling and fire. We can actually go before that God and have confidence and speak freely and openly to Him. Because he's not separated from us anymore because we have Jesus Christ, his son, as our advocate. And we're adopted into his family through faith in Jesus. We can have freedom of speech before God, like go to him for anything in the same way that my little nine-month-old baby looks at me. And I even just know from a look from him what he needs already. I'm like an expert parent at nine months old. (laughs) He looks at me with kind of like a, like this kind of look, you know, I can't even do it. It's a, and I, and I know he wants to be picked up. Or he might say like this, "Eh," because he doesn't even have the words. He doesn't have the words yet. But even from his groans, He looks at me and he makes a groan, he makes a noise. And he's confident in that if I do that to daddy, daddy's going to come and get me and help me. He's going to take me out of the bouncy chair or he's going to give me one of these puff snacks or he's going to do anything I want. (laughs) You can see who's really in control here. See, my son doesn't even have speech, but he has freedom of speech before his dad. He can say anything to me. I I want him to say things to me. I keep saying, say dada. (laughs) And he says, mama. (laughs) Purposely he does that. (laughs) Because I say, say dada. And he says, mama. He laughs because he knows. He knows I want that. And he's playful. And he comes, he comes to me. He's open with me. He has confidence before his dad. He knows he can come to me for anything. He's not afraid to come to me, to talk to me, to be free with me. That's the kind of relationship that God wants us to have with him. Speak freely with him. I think that Even liturgy, liturgy is not necessarily bad. Uh, You know, like prayers that are written down in high church and many hundreds of years ago, okay, that's pretty much all there was, was liturgy and reading prayers. And like, you, you couldn't go to God freely, openly, you had to use the book of prayer or whatever, and that, that was the prescribed way to talk to God. God wants us to come to him with confidence and boldness and openness. Of course, with respect. Just like we're to respect our father. That's what John is saying that we can have here. 
By this we know that we are of the truth and, re and reassure our heart before Him. And whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And He knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. I'm going to get to what that means there in a second. The Christian's confidence comes not from what he's done. I don't go before God and say, ah, because I've been really good today, Lord, I can come to you with confidence and boldness. It comes from what Christ has done for us on the cross. Jesus was condemned so that we would not have to be. He is our substitute. He's the only one, friends, who is actually able to legitimately give us a clear conscience. See, because if our conscience is not clear, if our heart does condemn us, if our heart says, ah, but you've done this and that and all these things, then we're not going to come confidently and boldly and freely to God. Instead, what, what is the man, natural man going to naturally do? What Adam and Eve did in the garden? Sew some fig leaves together and hide from God. And hide around the tree and not approach God. When God, when the Lord is walking the garden in the cool of the day, Adam and Eve weren't standing out there in the open like they normally were. See, at that time, when they were, before they sinned, the Lord comes, I don't know how this all worked in Eden. The Lord comes down out of heaven, and he's walking with them, and they're like, hey, Lord, I love you. Give them a hug. And then when sin came in, their conscience was pricked, and their hearts condemned them, and they tried to hide. They no longer had that anymore. And then they didn't want to come before God openly and freely. That's what sin does to us. It's, what the, it's like the, one of the worst consequences of the fall, one of the worst consequences of sin. It's a, this broken relationship between man and God. And then what flows out of that, if you have a broken relationship between yourself and God, then you have a broken relationship between yourself and others too. And brokenness, brokenness in relationships, that's one of the worst things that came from the fall, and one of the worst consequences of sin. But Jesus Christ can restore that. You see, that's what he does. He breaks down the dividing wall of separation, even between man and God, and between man and man. That's why we can come with boldness. And it's possible to know for certain if you're saved and for certain if you have eternal life or not. John says in verse, chapter 5, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Those who trust in Jesus Christ have confidence, real confidence. But you know, there's such a thing as false confidence. As confidence, uh, you know, some people, they think that they have confidence to go before God. So, well, let me give you two problems on either side of the spectrum. Some people have a problem on one side of the spectrum, but where they're weighed down with guilt and shame, they're terrified of approaching God for that reason. They see their sin, they know their unworthiness, they're unwilling to come to Christ for the removal of their guilt and shame. So not only do they not pray or ask God for anything, but they hide from Him. They, I can't tell you how many times unbelieving people that I know have said to me, I can't go into a church, lightning would strike if I walk into the church. Ha 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 ha. All right, and they say that like as a joke. I mean, haven't you heard people say that? If I walk through the doors of a church, oh, the church is going to fall down. All right, why, why do they say that? What does that even mean? It's because somewhere inside their heart, they know that they're guilty. They don't want to be confronted with the truth of sin in their life. They don't want that. So they stay far away from the church where they know that the gospel is going to be preached. It's going to convict them. They hide instead. So some people have a problem on that side of the spectrum. But then, on the other side of the spectrum, there's those who have a false confidence before God, either because they're ignorant of their own sin, and they think that they have no reason to tremble before the Almighty God, which, by the way, is also very common. There's lots of people who think that they're not sinners, or at least not in any, in any grievous way. I mean, I, I think that's even more of a problem. People don't even recognize, they're ignorant. They, rec they don't even recognize the holiness of God or the heinousness of sin. And so they say like, hey, I'm, I'm a good person. So when I die, I'm pretty sure I have enough good works built up into my account that God's going to weigh that against the bad and I'll go into heaven, no problem. 
met a guy in a bar one time who told me that he was going to get on an airplane the next day, and he said to me, he to, you know, I told him I was a pastor. See, see that's one of the, like, the best things about being a pastor. It's like when somebody asks me, what do you do for a living? And I say, I'm a pastor. Automatically, God comes up in the conversation then, and people start to talk, and, well, what do you think about this? And, well, what does God, you know, blah, 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 blah like that. I have no problem with evangelism. All I have to do is tell people what I do for a living. It's like really easy. Everyone should become a pastor, I guess. I, I don't know, but <laughs> not really. So, and he said he's going to get on an airplane. And he said, man, I, I hate flying because I always think the plane is going to crash. And boy, I'm just sure hopeful that I have enough good works to get my way in through the pearly gates. And I said, if you rely on your good works to enter heaven, it's like relying on a rope made out of sand to climb your way to the moon. You will not be able to do it. Absolutely not. And I shared the gospel with him, and he did not like it. <laughs> so there's these people who had this false confidence because they don't think that they're sinners. But then there's also these other people whose consciences are actually seared. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits, the teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. These are people who continue on in their sin for so long that they've developed something like a callous on their souls. Their souls are calloused. They... They don't feel guilt anymore. They might have, just because they're made in the image of God, they're not a Christian, but they're made in the image of God, they might have felt like at one time, hey, just even culturally doing this ABC thing is bad. I, I know that it's bad. I'm just going to keep doing it. And they do it, and they feel bad about it, but then they just keep doing it, and they feel less bad about it, and less bad and less bad until they don't feel bad about it at all. And those people might also have a false sort of confidence because they don't, feel it anymore. They don't feel any guilt. Sin no longer grieves their hearts because they've broken even their own standards for so long. They're numb. That's not what John is talking about in our passage. Believers in Christ, listen now, are very aware of their sin. And it grieves them when they fall into sin. That's actually a sign of being a born-again person. A born-again person actually grieves over their sin. It makes them sad when they sin. A false, empty confessor doesn't feel bad about their sin. They don't say, Lord, I've offended you. I've done it again, Lord. I'm sorry. Take my heart, take my life, consecrate it, Lord. Change me from the inside out. I'll do whatever it takes, Lord. I need your help. Do it for me. Change my heart. Continue to draw me toward you. A believer doesn't think like that, all right? I don't care. There were so many times, I mean, I remember when I first became a believer, suddenly I, I like said the F word and I was like, whoa, I probably shouldn't be saying that. Like before, before I was like, uh, I was at the mouth of a sailor. All right, seriously, you would not want to talk to pre-conversion David. All right, I would offend you. I offend you now, but in a different way. So <laughs> sometimes, anyway. But boy, my mouth was so rotten. Bad stuff was coming out of it. Like James says, the tongue is a whole world of evil and. But then, when the Lord saved me, suddenly I was convicted about that. I felt bad about it. And when those words that I was so used to saying were coming out, I would be like, whoa, stop it. God, help me change my mouth. Clean out my mouth. I'm a man of unclean lips. I need you to touch my mouth with a coal. Burn that away from me. I don't want that. I don't want to grieve you like that. So we feel bad about our sin when we sin, but we have the remedy for our sins. We have the remedy. We don't have to stay in guilt, all right? We don't have to stay in shame. We have the remedy for our sins. So what's the remedy for our sin? Christ. The blood of Christ. 
cleanses us, if we come to him, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then what does it mean to cleanse us from unrighteousness? Not only in act and in deed, but in our consciences too. He can cleanse our conscience so that our heart no longer condemns us. So that we can have confidence and boldness in coming before God. Lord Jesus Christ, we have adoption through Christ as God's children, and our confidence stems precisely from that. So more on that in just a little bit. People who trust in their works or their money will be disappointed. Zephaniah 1.18. When's the last time you read Zephaniah? Oh, not even a rhetorical question now. I think... I'm going to give you an assignment today, not a legalistic assignment, but you must do it. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking. I, why don't you just pick up your Bible today and just read Zephaniah, all right? That way, when you go to heaven, you could say, hey, man, I'm one of the 150 who read your book. <laughs> No, I'm serious. I'm serious. Read Zephaniah. Zephaniah 118 says, Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. People trust in that, though. They put their confidence in that. It's a false confidence. Look at what happened in 2008. The financial meltdown. They put your confidence in that. You're going to be disappointed. Some even put their confidence in their church. They say, boy, I belong to Crossview Church. I like this church. When I go... Before the Lord, I'm going to say, I belong to Crossview Church. They put their confidence in their family. My dad is a believer, and he raised me up in the faith. But the Gospel of John, chapter 1, 12 to 13, says, Yet to all who received him, Jesus, to those who believed in his name, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of natural descent, not just because your parents are believers or pastor or whatever, not of a human decision even, not because I... Forced my will to believe in Jesus. Not even of a husband's will. It's not because the person I'm married to really, really, really wants me to come to faith. But because you are born of God. Because the Spirit has done something inside of you. And people with false confidence are in the greatest danger. Because they're unaware of the danger that they're in. I've said that so many times to you. If worst possible position a person can ever be in is to think that they're a Christian when they're really not. To think that they have confidence when they go before God and they really are, have built their confidence on something other than Jesus Christ and Him alone. And those who put their faith in Jesus and Jesus alone can have true confidence and a clear conscience. Do you know there's almost nothing more valuable in life than to have a clear conscience? You can have all the money in the world. If you have a burdened conscience, what does it help you? What good is it if you can't close your eyes in peace every night? If, this, if your sins weigh you down and you can't get out from under them, so what about the money you have? So what about the possessions that you have? All of that means nothing. It means nothing. You don't have peace. But Christ can give you peace, not only in the day of judgment, but even now. So how do we know if we've really put our faith in Jesus? That's a good question. John answers that question a couple of verses back with one of the signs or marks of being a true Christian. Look at verse 18 and 19. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. And by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. Whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and He knows everything. As we've been learning over the last few weeks, love is one of the marks of a true Christian. And if real love is bearing itself out in our lives, love for God and love for others, it's one of the ways we can know that we belong to Jesus. Really. If we have faith in Him and our love for God and love for others stems from that, and our hearts don't condemn us and then we have confidence before God. But then John goes even further. Look at verse 22. And whatever we ask 
We receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. All right, I'm going to ask a very difficult question now. Has anyone here ever prayed and asked God for something and not gotten what they asked? To raise your hand. What are we to do with this verse? What are we to do with a verse like this then? And whatever, whatever we ask from Him, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. It says we receive from Him anything we ask. This verse necessitates the great question, what are we to do about unanswered prayer? We have to be careful. We have to be careful because this has been a stumbling block to many, many people. I've told the story before of my professor at Harper College, who was his, got his Ph.D. from Trinity, and he was a New Testament professor, and he left the church. I mean, left the faith entirely because of this issue, because he said he felt like his prayers were hitting an iron dome above his head, and, and nothing that he was asking for he was getting an affirmative on. God, he felt like God kept saying no to everything he was asking him. And he walked away from God. Now, I would make the argument that he never truly knew God. But this is still an issue, isn't it? It's an issue that we all have to deal with. But we don't have to despair about it. The Bible has the answer for everything, for all of our problems. Listen now, this book has the answer for everything that's wrong in our life. It has the answer for it. It has the answer to this question as well. On the face of it, this verse seems to be saying that God will grant any request we make of him. On the other hand, the Apostle Paul asked God three times to be relieved of his thorn in the flesh. Remember that in 2 Corinthians 2, 8-9. And God refused. He said, no, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. So what is the answer? If Paul can be denied his request, should we say that he didn't have enough faith? The Apostle Paul, the, maybe the greatest Christian who ever lived, did he just not have enough faith and that's the reason why? No, because God deemed that it was better for him that he not remove the thorn in Paul's flesh, whatever that thorn was. It was better for him, for Paul, and it was most glorifying to God that that would be the case. We see it in John chapter 11, don't we? Lazarus' sisters send word to Jesus, the one you love is sick, come help him, heal him, Lord. That's basically what they're asking. You've opened the eyes of the blind man in John chapter 9, two chapters later. Come heal Lazarus. He has this really, really bad cold and we haven't invented antibiotics yet. And Jesus stays where he is for two more days. And then he comes and Lazarus is in the tomb now. Ah, this question was very real for Lazarus' sisters. They came to Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. You see that? You see what's underneath that statement that Martha and Mary are saying to Jesus? They're saying, why didn't you answer our prayer to you? Why didn't you say yes? Why? Well, Jesus tells his disciples, it's better that I was not there. Because now... I'm going to be glorified through this because now something much more amazing is going to happen. More amazing than healing some illness that's going to, that could have resulted in death because now Christ is actually going to raise the dead. And a much more like amazing, glorious thing happens because Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. Everyone knows he, he's dead. You know how they know it? Because he stinks like a dead person. And Lazarus and the Lord says to Lazarus, Lazarus, come out! That was why God said no. That was why Jesus said no. He had something much better, much better. So, so let me give you a couple of reasons why 
Sometimes God says no to our prayers. First, there are limitations on what God will give. God will not literally give us anything we ask. If you prayed, hey, Lord God, I want to be God for a day, and you promised anything I ask, I receive it, right? Is he going to say yes to that prayer? No, no. If you prayed, oh, Lord, please let me live in a pineapple under the sea. That's all I've ever wanted, Lord, I'm coming boldly before you with confidence. You will give me whatever I ask. I want to live in a pineapple under the sea. I want to grow gills in my neck and be able to breathe underwater. Will the Lord answer that? I don't know if he will. (laughs) I've, I've never actually prayed that prayer. I don't know. I mean, maybe you should try to ask that. I don't know. No, God's not going to answer a request like that. Also, God's not going to Uh, answer a request to approve of our sin. If we pray asking God to help us embezzle money or to cheat on a test, he's not going to say, oh yes, sure, no problem, I'll I'll help you with that, Uh, I'll grant that. No, because he will not grant requests contrary to his holy will. So there's conditions that are set on what God is going to grant. Second, the context of this promise here in John is not unconditional. What does it say? Whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Why? Because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. God has no obligation to grant the requests of people who do not keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. What obligation does God have? Is God a genie? People treat Him like a genie or like a cosmic slot machine. That's not what God is. If we keep his commandments and if we do what pleases him. But if we're living in disobedience to him, he's under no obligation to grant our requests. I mean, in uh, James chapter 4 and verse 3, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so James says that the enemies of God aren't going to get what they ask. No, it's conditional. This is a conditional promise. Third, we must not take this verse out of context regarding the rest of Scripture as well. There are conditions placed on God's promise to answer prayer. John 15, 7 says we have to abide in Him. James, as we saw, says we cannot ask anything out of our own selfish desire. And we must ask according to His will. Uh, In 1 John chapter 5, we're going to get there, Lord willing. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. And this is the confidence. Remember, he's talking about confidence here, boldness in approaching God. This is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So these are the keys to prayer. to have faith in God and obey His commands. We can have confidence when we come before God, confidence in our standing, and confidence in our requests. Look at verse 22 again. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. Look, this verse... It's actually not about getting what we want. It's not about getting what we want. It's about the confidence that a believer has that the Father loves me and will do what's best for me, that I can ask Him anything freely and trust that His answer to me is going to be what's best for me. That's what it's really about. It's about trusting God. It's about having confidence before God, being bold with God. God wants us to be like that, like a little trusting child who trusts his father. See, the pernicious error of name it and claim it theology, the stuff that we see all over the place. Amy and I were, uh, we were at the uh, uh, the, the Fox Lake uh, Library yesterday. And I saw the T.D. Jakes Study Bible. It's almost a... uh, uh, contradiction in terms, okay? <laughs> Honestly. 
And I was looking through it, and there's so much in there about this, like, prosperity teaching garbage nonsense. If you just name it and claim it, we somehow put, you know, shackle God to some kind of a promise or a contract. And that kind of theology treats a verse like this as a, as a contractual agreement. There's no love for God there. There's no understanding of God's love there. That's like, it's treating God like Cain does. Remember what Cain did. Here, I'm going to bring my offering. God wants an offering. I'll bring an offering. It doesn't have to be the kind of offering that my brother Abel brings. I'm just going to bring an offering. And because I've brought an offering, I expect that now this contractual agreement is going to happen. God is going to give me something good because I've brought something to him. And God doesn't work like that. This isn't a contract. It's not about that. It's not about treating God as though what I want is most important. That's a twisting of the scripture. You see, you, you remember the, the prodigal sons. In Luke, both of the sons were using the father for his stuff. One son asked the father and says to him, give me my share of the inheritance. And then, even before he's dead, you know, you only get your inheritance after your father's dead. All right? This guy is so bold he just wants his father's stuff. And so he says, give me the stuff that's already going to be mine. You're pretty old now, Dad. You're going to die pretty soon. So I want it now, all right? I don't want to wait. And the father graciously gives him his share of the inheritance, which then he goes and squanders and then says, ah, well, I had it better at home. He comes back. The father receives him. And then you have the older son who when the father's throwing a party because his dead son, the one that he thought he lost, had come back and he's alive again, the older son comes and he's like, hey, what the heck, man? You never threw a party like this for me and I've been here working and working and you haven't given me stuff. I want stuff. I want this a big party for me. You see, the younger son in that parable, he's just basically stealing from his dad. He just wants the stuff. But the older son in the parable also just wants the stuff. He just works for it. He doesn't really care about his father. He wants the stuff that his father can give him. When people read the parable of the prodigal son, a lot of times they look at it like, what a bad guy the younger son is who took his father's inheritance. No, 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 look, both of them are bad. All right? Both of them are bad because their emphasis is on the wrong thing. Their emphasis is on the blessings that God can give them instead of the blessing of having God. Because if we have God, we have everything. What did the Father say in the parable of the prodigal son? All that I have is yours. It's all yours. You don't have to be angry. You have me. And if you have me, you have everything. And I'm always going to do what's right for you, son. Always. Always. That's what we have in God the Father through Christ. We need to be like, maybe reassess or recalibrate the way that we look at getting things from God. We need to recalibrate our mind. Have confidence that the God that I serve, I can come to Him and I can say, Lord, I really want this thing. Whatever it is. Whether it's healing from the sickness or a job or I want some kind of thing to have enough money to take my wife out to dinner or whatever it is. I can come to God freely and openly and boldly and say, Lord, I really want this thing. And trust. According to His will, He'll give it to me. If it's not, then it's even better that it's not. It's better that it's not then because He has something better for me. Look, this right here is where faith comes in. This is the, the, really the crux of faith. 
right here. This is it. This is it. Don't miss this point right now. Do you believe that God is good? Do you actually believe that he has your good in mind? Do you trust in him? Do you put your life in his hands? If the answer to that question is yes, then I can be satisfied with a lot or satisfied with a little. Because I know that my God is a good God. I know that my God proved his goodness and his love for me in sending his son Jesus to die for me. And if I lost everything, if I lost all my money, if I lost all my friends, if I lost my job, if I lost my house, if I lost my family, if I lost everything on this earth, I will not lose him. He will walk with me And I trust him no matter what. And I believe that in the end, I will see my Redeemer stand upon the earth. That's the only thing that could sustain Job after he lost everything. Because the reality is, friends, truly, the reality is, every single one of us at a faster or slower pace, is at some point going to become like Job. Do you understand that? We are going to lose our loved ones. We are going to lose things that we have. We're going to lose it all because you cannot bring a U-Haul into your grave with you. You're going to lose everything on this earth. You are. You're going to lose your health. You're going to lose your possessions. And you're going to lose, at least temporarily, the people that you love. It's going to happen. And the question is, do you really believe that there is a God, and that God is good, and that He has you in his hand, and he will bring you safely to the promised land. That's where faith comes in. I mean, I mean, ultimately, friends, why are we sitting here? Why are we in this church right now? What's the purpose of being here on this Sunday? You could be at home watching TV. You could be doing something else, gardening or whatever. Why are you here right now? Why are you sitting here? I hope it's for this reason. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and that we love one another. Is that why? You're here because you believe in the name of Jesus Christ and you want to hear more about him, more about his love for you because you forget about it, just like I do. I forget about God's love. All the time I forget the fact that God loves me. I I, I forget the fact that I belong to him and he's, he's holding me in His hand, and when terrible things happen, I have to be reminded that I belong to Jesus. I have to be reminded that God is sovereign over everything that ever happens. He's sovereign over it. And all the black times of despair and horrible things that happen in this world, someday, in the light of eternity, we'll be able to look at those things as the backdrop to the beautiful gem of God's purpose in the world. That's the, that's the Christian faith. Look, that's the crux of it. You either believe that or you're wasting your life. And John says, this is the, the commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and that we love one another? I mean, think about this. It's pretty simplified, (laughs) all right? This is pretty simplified. There's only two things that are required. Believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him for your soul. And love each other. In the one hand, it's the easiest thing in the world. Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. On the other hand, it's the most impossible, hardest thing in the whole world because we naturally hate. We naturally hate our enemies. 
We naturally hate God. That's what the Bible says. And therefore, this command is impossibly hard. And actually, you know, you might say that you don't hate because you don't yell. Hey, can I? Oh, all right. I have, I have one more minute now to finish my sermon. Think I can do it? No. I'm going to try. Raise your hand if you're not a yelling kind of person. You're not, like, not a yeller, right? Yeah, yeah, all right. Raise your hand if you are a yelling kind of person. All right, because I, I yell from here <laughs> and other places sometimes. So, all right, just because you're not a yelling person, like a, you can't see mm, on your face when you're mad, you, you hold it in, that doesn't mean that that's not actually there. You understand? And I'm not, I'm not impugning anyone in this room, but what I'm saying is this. A person can exhibit hate by being the nicest person in the world. Do you know that? You can hate someone by being the nicest person in the world. You're so nice that you use people and you manipulate them by your niceness. Oh, that can happen for real. And that's not love. That's also hatred. And I think sometimes we look at hatred like hatred only means I hate you. All right? But that's the only way it looks like. And it doesn't only look like that. It doesn't only look like that. I can be nice to someone in order to manipulate them. I can hate simply by omission, by not doing something for someone. So anger doesn't equal hate. It's just an emotion. When John tells us to have faith in Jesus and love each other, it must come from the Spirit dwelling within us because naturally, friends, naturally, whether you yell or you don't yell, whether it's on your face or it's inside your heart, naturally, we are not loving people. Naturally. But through the Spirit, we are and we can be. And that's what he says, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God abides in him. Thank God for that. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given to us. Jesus said, if you love me, you obey what I command. We are commanded to believe in Jesus and to love each other. And those who do it live in him and he in them and he gives us the Spirit. And we know that we belong to Jesus by the Spirit that he gave us because his Spirit bears the fruit of love in our life. We can know it. And if we see that, you see, if we see that coming out of us, that, wow, wow, I'm actually really loving a person I couldn't love before. It's really coming out of me right now. I, I, it's not for me, because, boy, I sure wouldn't be able to love them before. But I do. I really care about them. I care about their well-being, actually. And we see that happening. And we see that my sin grieves me, and, Lord, I want to serve you. Then we can have peace and no, ah, I'm fighting the good fight. I'm going to finish the race. The Lord is working within me. I can have boldness and confidence before Him. Amen. That's what the Lord wants from us. Let's pray. Father, please send your Spirit into our hearts to bear fruit. The fruit of of repentance and love and faith in Christ. Father, be with this church. Help us to come boldly to Christ, boldly before the throne. Help us to believe that you're a good God and that you care about us and you love us. Help us to, like a little child, rest in your love for us no matter what our circumstances are and to trust that you'll give us anything we ask according to your will if we ask for it and it's what's right and best for us then you'll say yes and if it's not then you'll say no because you have something better help us to trust that your will for us is better than our will for us in Jesus name Amen.